I died in my bath, electrocuted by my phone while on a video call with my best friend. My name is Maria Antonietta Cutillo, and I was from Italy. This all happened on the evening of May 3rd, 2023, when I was just 16 years old. I was on a call with Fabi, my best friend, talking and laughing together as we usually did. But suddenly I felt an indescribable pain and screamed my friend's name just before dying. My best friend, powerless to the scene and having seen everything, immediately contacted the emergency services. But it was already too late, I was dead, electrocuted instantly. What caused my death was mainly the fact that my phone was charging at the same time. My best friend witnessed my last breath while I was screaming her name on the video call. She even made a very touching TikTok video about it to express her sadness over this event that cost me my life. To you who are watching this video, never use your phone in your bath. It could happen to anyone. I murdered my entire family for a cam girl. I am Grant Amato. At the time, I had a normal life in Florida with a close-knit family. Then, one day, I fell into an obsession with a Bulgarian cam girl named Sylvie. It started as a simple indulgence, but it spiraled out of control. I emptied my savings, family funds, everything, for virtual interactions with her. Of course, my family found out. They were furious, disappointed. They gave me an ultimatum. Stop this madness or be cut off. And you know what? I chose Sylvie. I severed ties with my family, even stole money from my own brother to feed this virtual obsession. Yeah, you got it right. I was completely lost. The situation worsened. My family tried to bring me back to reason, but I was so immersed in this virtual life that I couldn't turn back. And one day, everything changed. My family was found murdered at home. They said I did it. Imagine being accused of killing your own family. It's the craziest thing that could happen, right? In the end, I was found guilty. My whole life turned upside down because of this unhealthy obsession. Today, I'm here in prison, wondering how I got to this point. I burned my husband after he raped our seven-year-old daughter. My name is Tatanisha Hedman, and one evening when I finished work early, I wanted to surprise my family, and as I walked into the house and passed my daughter's bedroom door, I heard her crying in the background. When I opened the door, I discovered that my husband Vincent Phillips was raping her. My first thought was to take the gun and kill him, but that was far too kind of punishment for what he'd just done. So I waited until he was fast asleep before entering the room with a can of gasoline, poured it all around the bed, took a lighter, and lit the fire. Very quickly the room was completely engulfed in flames, and then I fled. I was quickly arrested, and unluckily my husband didn't die, but was taken to hospital with serious burns. I was sentenced to 12 years in prison in 2012, but I don't regret what I did. I did what I thought was best to protect my daughter and avenge her. Some people think that what I did was perfectly justified and that I was right to do it, and other people think I'm a monster, and what do you think? This is a scary story about Do Not Open. There was an 18-year-old girl named Mia who was in her first year at college. She lived alone in an apartment near her university. One night when she was doing the dishes, she got a call from her friend Pete. She picked it up and he said, I'm bored, I want to hang out. Mia said, yeah, me too, come over. Pete then said he'll be over in 15 to 20 minutes. She then hung up and decided to take a shower. Mia was in the middle of shampooing her hair when she suddenly heard a loud banging on the door. She stuck her head out of the shower and said, come in, it's open. But a few minutes later, the banging on the door started again. She then stuck her head out of the shower again and said, come in, it's not locked. Just then her phone started to ring and it was Peter. Mia said, I'm in the shower, why don't you stop knocking and just come in? Peter's voice sounded extremely scared and he said, do not open the door. Mia said, why not? I'm outside your apartment building, whispered Peter. And I just saw a strange woman coming up the stairs to your apartment covered in blood and holding a knife. And she was smiling weirdly and didn't look human at all. I glued the mouth and eyes of my one-year-old daughter with super glue. My name is Johnny Lee Carter, and I was 29 years old in 2018 when I committed an unthinkable act to stop my daughter's crying while I was supposed to take care of my little girl who was just one year old. While my wife was out shopping, she wouldn't stop crying, and I tried to calm her for a long time, but to no avail, she kept crying. Her screams became unbearable and drove me to a rage. Then I tried to strangle her, but she started screaming even more, and I was even less able to calm her down. That's when I saw a tube of glue next to me. I grabbed it, and without thinking, I put some on her eyes and mouth. 
Then I realized what I had done and fled. A few moments later, her mother returned, discovering the horror I had committed. She immediately called emergency services who were able to repair all the damage I had caused. And my daughter will have no lasting effects from what I did. A week later, I was arrested by the police more than a hundred kilometers from our home where I had fled. What punishment do you think I deserve? This is what it looks like crashing at different speeds and it's absolutely mind-blowing. This is the heartbreaking final request this girl made before she was brutally killed. It was 2008 and Eve Carson was 22 years old. She was living in North Carolina and was a student at the university. She was incredibly passionate about helping others and participated in many organizations, including a hunger relief organization. In the early hours of the morning on March the 5th, 2008, things would take a very dark turn. Lawrence Levette, age 20, had an extensive criminal background. On the night in question, he rang one of his friends called Jason and asked him to drive him and his friend to Chapel Hill to rob someone. Jason actually declined this, so Lawrence and his friend Demario Atwater went on their way to find a victim. At around 3.30am, Eve had actually been going to her car to get something. At this point, the pair decided to strike. They forced their way into her car and held her at gunpoint. They took her to some cash machines and forced her to take out money for them. She tried to reason with the men and just say, you know, you've taken my money now, please just let me go. However, they showed no mercy and decided they had to kill her because she'd seen their faces. They drove her to a wooded area and heartbreakingly, it seemed like Eve realized what was about to happen. Obsessingly, she asked the pair to pray with her. They then callously shot her five times. Locals in the area reported to police that they had heard gunshots. Eve's body was found shortly after, and it wasn't long before police started scouring CCTV. Police identified the killers and they were sentenced to life in prison. This is the disturbing case of Robert Moan that stunned Scotland. Robert Moan was born in Dundee. He reportedly had a difficult upbringing and was abused by his dad throughout his childhood. He was bullied and ultimately was expelled from school. He served in the army and reportedly turned to alcohol to cope with depression. On the 1st of November 1967, Robert was 19 years old. He'd been drinking in a pub that day and decided to take revenge on the school that had expelled him. He was dressed in uniform and armed himself with a shotgun as he entered 26-year-old Nanette Hansen's class. It was a class of 11 girls aged between 14 and 15. Nanette was pregnant with her first child at this time. He subjected the students and their teacher to a one and a half hour ordeal. He R'd one girl and S-A'd another before brave Nanette convinced him to let the girls go. However, before doing so, he made Nanette turn around and shot her in the back. She died on her way to hospital. After the murder, Robert was deemed insane in the High Court in Dundee and was ordered to be detained without limit at the state hospital. However, that would not be the end of Robert's crimes. In 1976, he broke out of Carstairs Hospital with fellow inmate and lover Thomas McCulloch. They had plotted the escape for ages, collecting weapons to help them do so. During their bid for freedom, they murdered another inmate and a male nurse and also killed a police officer before eventually being recaptured. Robert's partner in crime, Thomas, was released in 2013 and is believed to be living in Dundee now. Robert's in his 70s and remains in prison and he is Scotland's longest serving prisoner. 
For the outside world, these expectant parents had a picture-perfect life. What happened next would prove that that couldn't have been further from the truth. Joshua Hilberling was 23 years old. He'd been married to his wife, Amber, for around a year and the pair lived in an apartment in Oklahoma. Now, Amber was 19 and the pair were known to have quite a volatile relationship and regularly get into arguments. Joshua's parents stated that Amber would abuse him throughout the relationship. He'd apparently even visited a domestic violence intervention service to seek help. Now, Joshua actually filed a protective order against Amber after an incident in which she hit him across the head with a lamp. It was so bad that he had to go to hospital and get stitches. Joshua reportedly wanted to leave Amber, but he felt trapped as she was seven months pregnant with his child. The protective order was never finalised as the pair never turned up to court. On the 7th of June 2011, the pair had another one of their serious fights. This one, though, would be the last fight they would ever have. Shockingly, in the middle of a disagreement, Amber pushed Joshua out of their window of their 25th floor apartment. He fell to his death and Amber was soon arrested and charged with second degree murder. Amber's lawyers would argue that Joshua was the abuser in the relationship and that she pushed him in self-defense. Amber claimed that Joshua was kicked out of the US Air Force for substance abuse, and this is one factor that she said caused serious arguments between them. In court, though, a jury did find her guilty of second-degree murder and she got 25 years in prison. Amber gave birth to a baby boy and her family took over custody. On October the 26th, 2016, after Amber served three years in prison, she was found deceased in her cell. A coroner ruled that her death was a self-unaliving. Do you notice anything odd about this last photo of this girl alive? It was 2012 and Alicia Bromfield from Illinois was 21 years old. She was a student at Western Illinois University, just one semester away from graduating. She was studying forensic psychology and criminal justice and was six months pregnant. She'd already picked the name Ava for her unborn baby girl. Now, although the father of the baby wasn't around, she was preparing for single motherhood. Little did she know, neither her nor her unborn child would survive much longer. 36-year-old Brian Cooper was Alicia's boss at Home Depot. The two seemed fairly close and sometimes met outside of work and walked Brian's dog. There was never anything romantic between them, though. Brian was actually very abusive to Alicia. He would call her derogatory names in front of members of staff and shockingly even customers. He was even witnessed throwing things at her, but she felt that she had to stay in the job. She knew she was soon about to be a mother, so she was worried about the financial implications of not having a job. Brian continued to bully Alicia and make her life miserable. He would purposely make her work extra hours just so he could spend extra time with her. She actually started to report this to management, but nothing was ever done. In August 2012, he started pressuring her to attend his sister's wedding with him. She didn't want to go, but he threatened to sack her if she didn't. Her mum was really concerned about Alicia being forced to go to this wedding. Alicia reassured her, however, that she was simply going as a friend and that they'd be back the next day. Alicia's mum was comforted by the fact that Brian told Alicia they were going to be staying at the same hotel as the rest of the wedding party. This was the Sand Bay Resort in Wisconsin. However, this was a lie. On the 17th of August, the pair drove four hours to the hotel, and when they got there, Alicia realised that they weren't staying in the same hotel as everyone else. They got into an argument about this, and the argument escalated when Brian made sexual advances to Alicia. She told her mum on the phone that she was really, really fed up with how he was acting and that she'd lost her patience with him. She told Brian that they would go to the wedding together, but they would not remain friends afterwards. They went to the wedding together and Brian got more and more drunk as the evening went on. Afterwards, they went back to the hotel and got into their separate beds for the evening. When Brian started harassing Alicia again, she again rejected him and this time he launched a vicious attack. He dragged her to the ground and strangled her. She screamed out, think of the baby, but he didn't and he killed her. He then awed her body as she lay deceased. The next morning, he showed up to a local petrol station and asked to use the phone. He rang police and admitted to intentionally killing her. He said, I'm a good person besides what I did last night. Alicia's family is going to flip. Everyone is going to flip. Police raced to the scene and arrested him. They found Alicia's body nude in the hotel room with just a blanket covering her. It was later discovered that Brian had been so obsessed with Alicia that he'd actually been recording her with spy cameras. He was ultimately convicted of two counts of first degree intentional homicide and given two life sentences. What? Look at there, 
This one really is heartbreaking. I'm going to put a trigger warning on this straight away. It's a tough one to listen to. Near Glassy was folded into a ball and placed into a tumble dryer on high heat for 30 minutes. She was just three years old. She practically became the poster child for child abuse in New Zealand back in 2007, but the tumble dryer wasn't what killed her. That she survived and she went on to suffer horrific abuse at the hands of her mother's boyfriend, his brother and other family members before eventually passing away. Nia's mother, Lisa Cooker, was 35 at the time of Nia's death and she was in a relationship with Wiramu Curtis, who was just 17. Nia had other siblings, but for some reason she was singled out and she was practically used as a punch bag by Wiramu and his brother Michael. Other family members were often at the house and they witnessed the abuse but did absolutely nothing. These two monsters would practice wrestling moves on Nia. She'd have chunks of wood dropped on her. She was often kicked, beaten, slapped and jumped on. She was held over a burning fire, flung against walls, spun on an outdoor clothes arrow until she was thrown off. And one of the other children in the house recalled how Wirimu had picked Nia up by her hips and neck. And once she reached the ceiling, he let go. The final blow came in July 2007, when Nia was violently kicked in the head. Despite clearly being injured and unconscious, Nia was left on the floor and when her mother Lisa came home from work, she too didn't call an ambulance. She put Nia in the bath and then put her to bed. She then spent the night partying with her boyfriend and other family members while they celebrated a 21st birthday. By the time Nia was taken to hospital, it had been 36 hours since the fatal blow and she couldn't survive her injuries. She did fight for another 13 days on life support, but she passed away on August 3rd, 2007. During Nia's hospitalisation, her mother Lisa was spotted partying in various clubs and that just sickens me. During the investigation into Nia's death, practically all of the adults in that house tried to blame each other. But ultimately, it was the testimonies of the other children that lived there that led to their arrests. Following a four-week trial in November 2008, Nia's mother Lisa was found guilty of two counts of manslaughter and she was sentenced to nine years in prison. She was actually paroled in 2015, but she was sent back to prison after breaking her release conditions. However, she has now since been released. Two other family members were found guilty of child abuse and sentenced to jail time, but have two now been released. Wiramu Curtis and his brother Michael Curtis were both found guilty of Nia's murder, and they were both sentenced to life in prison. The presiding judge wept as she read out the sentences, and she offered counselling to all members of the jury. Singer-songwriter Maisie Rika actually wrote a song dedicated to Nia, and you can find it on YouTube, but be warned, you will need tissues. This might be the most disturbing case in human history, and before I begin, you've been warned. On January 19th, 1996, the mutilated remains of Diao Aikwing, who disappeared nine days prior, were found across multiple locations in China. Her body had been dismembered into over 2,000 pieces. The case remains unsolved, and it's one of the most notorious crimes in Chinese history. On January 10th, 1996, in the evening, Diao and her college roommate were punished for the illegal use of an electric appliance. After a conflict with the dormitory management, she left the building and did not return. Diao was last seen alive wearing a red coat with a black lining. She was reported missing, but her family was not notified by the authorities until January 19th. The discovery of Diao's remains in the winter of January 19th was first reported by a sanitary worker Initially, he thought it was pork, so he brought it home for food. And while preparing the meat for himself, three human fingers were found in it. The worker then reported the discovery to the police and they confirmed they were human fingers. Human remains in plastic wrapped packages were eventually discovered across eight locations around the university, including at a stadium, entrance gate, hospital, and along roadsides. The police later confirmed that the scattered remains were of Diao's and informed her father to visit Neijing. Between January 20th and 30th, Diao's head and clothes were found. More than 2,000 human remains were recovered. Diao's head and internal organs were boiled for several days. Crucial organs including the heart, liver, and spleen were never found. 
The forensics team was only able to identify the remains as belonging to a female through the analysis of body hair and muscle tissue. Relatives of Diao were able to identify her through a mole on her right cheek. A senior officer involved in the case described the killing as really cruel, which in my opinion is a nice way to put it. The officer also added that the pieces of flesh were dissected with high precision, only achieved by an individual with great understanding of anatomy. Police concluded that the murderer must have been a professional butcher or surgeon. Teachers and students then became the subject of investigation. Two suspect profiles were brought up including a single, physical, fit, middle-aged male. However, the university department could not find any individuals that matched the characteristics of the profile. A major investigation was launched in the university and the areas around. But, no major clues of the crime were found and the case failed to make any progress. In 2016, Nanjing police told the family of Diao that the case is still under investigation. Okay, so let's talk about this case for a second. If the killer was never found and he had the skill to dissect somebody into 2,000 pieces and never get caught with it, don't you think he might be a serial killer? And if he was, how many more people do you think he murdered after Diao? The dedication and skill and honestly the obsession to cut somebody into 2,000 pieces and not get caught with it is crazy. This person could be walking around the streets of China today doing the same things to other people that he did the Diao. The thought of that is absolutely disturbing and may Diao rest in peace. This is a bit of a different one for me. I was recently contacted by a mother whose son died in 2020 under suspicious circumstances. Angie Solomon contacted me and she asked me to cover her son's death. So I really do want to get this out to as many people as possible so that she can get some signatures on her petition to open an investigation into her son's death because something doesn't seem right. So the last person to see Grant alive was his own father, Aaron Solomon. This is a man who is very well connected in Nashville, Tennessee, um, where they lived and where Grant died. He's a former radio host, TV host, news anchor, and he has a lot of connections very high up. He's also a man that's abused his family for years, Grant, his mother, and Grant's little sister, who he sexually abused for years from a very young age even raping her at one point. Grant promised his little sister Gracie that once he turned 18, he would do everything he could, everything in his power to protect her and get her away from their father. Just after he turned 18 was when he was killed. So this is Angie with Grant and she's asked me to cover this story just to get it out there and get as many details out there as possible because something doesn't seem right, doesn't add up. There are so many little bits to this story when I've looked into it that just just don't add up. Um, they seem very suspicious and there was never a proper investigation done into his death. So she has a petition on her page. If you go onto her profile, I will tag her. On her link tree, there is a petition and she needs 300,000 signatures. She's so close, she's got over 200,000 um, and she needs an investigation opening into her son's death. So I'll take you back to the day that he died. So it was July 20th, 2020, and Grant had recently had COVID. He'd also been diagnosed with asthma and wasn't feeling 100% himself. Grant was a baseball player, and on this day, his dad, Aaron, had scheduled a private baseball session for them at a local sports club, despite the fact that Aaron had just had COVID, just been diagnosed with asthma and wasn't feeling himself. So Aaron has given multiple different stories about what happened that morning, but they basically all end with Grant ending up underneath his truck, pinned underneath his truck, and this is what killed him, according to Aaron. So in one version of events, Aaron says that he was in his own car checking work emails. When he heard a loud bang, he looked up to see Grant's truck in the ditch at the end of the parking lot, and Grant was trapped underneath. Another version is that Aaron saw Grant stood behind his truck when it started rolling backwards, dragging him underneath and pinning him underneath his truck inside the ditch. 
Aaron called 911 and told them what had happened. But to me, it sounds like he's talking to someone else while he's on the phone to 911. And he claimed that three men were also there with him. These three men were never found. He never really mentioned them again. They were never tracked down for an interview or anything like that by police. So that doesn't sound right to me. Somehow it drug him underneath it. Yes, my sign is under it. I'm trying to, no, I'm, I'm trying to call 911. Okay, what's your name? Oh my God. My name is Aaron Solomon. And you said oh you're my at 1357 South Water Avenue, right? Yes. How old yes. is the male? He's 18, he just turned 18 a couple of weeks, about a month ago. It's my son. Oh my God. Oh my God, this is not good. Is he awake and Oh, please hurry. To you? I don't no, I don't think so. He's not oh he's not alert, right? No, he's out. And he's trapped. I got three guys here and he's trapped under the truck. Okay. Oh my god. I understand, sir. Stay on the phone with me while we get somebody out there. What's your name? Aaron Solomon. Something about that phone call to me just doesn't seem genuine. If that was one of my children trapped under a truck, unresponsive. I would be frantic, I'd be panicking. He's very calm, almost like he's rehearsed what he's going to say, whether he's played out that day in his head a few times and he knew exactly what he was going to say to 911, I'm not sure. But to also not be anywhere near his son at that point, he was stood up at the top, top of the parking lot where I'm guessing his car was. He wasn't even down there where Grant's truck was. You'd be on the floor trying to speak to your son, surely, if that was your son trapped under there. This is where it gets really, really weird. So there wasn't a scratch on Grant's body. Um, to say that he'd been knocked down by his car, he'd been dragged down the parking lot into a ditch, there wasn't a scratch. The hospital said that there was a laceration to the back of his head and that he died from blunt force trauma. And on looking at Grant's belongings in his truck, there was a baseball bat missing. So he had a few large baseball bats, he had two baseball gloves and his small aluminium baseball bat was nowhere to be found and it's never been found. Another thing that's really weird is that Aaron said to Gracie um, after Grant's death that nothing would happen to his truck, he wouldn't sell it. He drove around in it for a few months and then claimed that it was totaled in the accident and claimed the insurance money. So Angie actually managed to track down the truck in Florida and she bought it back and it's really, really weird. There was blood splatter inside the vehicle. It was also underneath the truck, but how it got inside the vehicle, if he was killed by getting knocked down outside his truck, I have no idea. And when she got the black box looked at, it gets even weirder. So the black box in Grant's truck shows that in the last three seconds that the ignition was on, there was somebody sat in the driver's seat the accelerator was pushed down, the steering wheel was turned sharply to the right, and then the truck was put in park and the ignition was turned off. Now that can't have been Grant because he was supposedly underneath the truck. Also, according to a witness at the scene, Aaron was seen speaking to police, um, I'm guessing giving a statement, and then the police received a phone call and shortly after that phone call, the police left and just took Aaron's word and his version of events for what happened. There was no proper investigation done whatsoever. Even just looking at the scene here, it looks like that truck's been driven into that ditch. It doesn't look like it's rolled the other way. I mean, this piece of grass, supposedly Grant was dragged over this by his truck. Would that not all be flattened down if a person had been dragged over it? It just, nothing adds up with this story. None of the details make sense. Aaron's story doesn't make sense. And, if it was my son, I have three sons myself, and if this was one of them, I would be doing exactly what Angie is doing because she deserves justice, and so does Grant. So I will tag her, as I've said. Please go to her profile. She's got her petition in her link tree, and I hope to God that an investigation gets opened because she deserves justice for her son.